Welcome to this video on classical mechanics. I'm Jos Dyson and I've made this video for my students in the second year's course Classical Mechanics that I teach at Delft University of Technology. This movie is about a Kepler problem. In fact it's more general, it's about uh, two particles uh, moving under the influence of each other's attractive or repulsive force and then I will focus on the Kepler problem and I hope that you will enjoy this movie. So in the two-body problem we deal with two masses that we consider here to be point masses M1 and M2 and we are interested in the motion of these two masses. This problem is a classic problem in classical mechanics and uh, the major application is the Kepler problem which describes the motion of the planets around the Earth. Now in order to define the problem uh, we start by specifying the position of mass number 1 by a vector in three dimensions R1 and there is also such a vector for mass number 2 and that's R2. These masses exert forces onto each other and we assume that those forces can be derived from a potential and that potential depends only on the distance between 1 and 2 so we take a vector that runs from mass 1 up to mass 2 and then we take only the length of that factor given by the norm and so this is the potential which is in fact responsible for the particular motion that these two masses uh, will perform of course in addition to their initial velocities and positions because we will make very frequent use of this norm of R2 minus R1, we just use R in order to indicate that particular vector. So if we want to know the uh, force on particle 1, we take the gradient with respect to the vector R1 of the potential and using the chain rule, because the potential only depends on R1 through this coordinate R, we can uh, calculate this as the partial derivative of V with respect to R, that's its only argument, and then the R gradient with respect to vector R1. We do that as follows. So the gradient of R with respect to the vector R1, that's the, 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 the gradient with respect to that vector is just d dx1, d dy1, d dz1, so that's a vector operator, and the R is, is simply, remember that uh, R was R2 minus R1, so that's the square root of x1 minus x1 squared plus xy squ minus y1 squared plus z2 minus z1 squared. And if we work out those derivatives, we get the following vector. So it has three components. One component is x2 minus x1 divided by this denominator, y2 minus y1, and z2 minus z1. And it's easy to see that because of the square root, the denominator is 1 over that square root. And that square root, recall, that was just my r. So I can write this vector also as minus R2 minus R1 divided by R. And so this tells us, because this is a vector which it points from R1 to R2, this tells us that the direction of the force on particle 1 is directed along the line connecting R1 and R2, which will be no surprise. So if the particles have an attractive force, then R1 will be pulled towards R2. And then we can do the same calculation for R2, and it will not be surprising that we find the opposite in accordance with the Newton's third law. So that gives me R2 minus R1 divided by r. And this is to be multiplied by dv dr in order to obtain f1 is r1 minus r2 over r times dv dr. And we always have that f2 is minus the vector f1. So, so far, 
the uh, analysis is really elementary and just calculating the force and explicitly showing that the force is always directed along the line connecting R1 and R2 and the forces are opposite. In order to analyze the motion of the two masses we will use the Lagrangian formalism and uh, for the Lagrangian formalism we always need first to calculate the kinetic energy of the system and it will not be surprising that in this case the kinetic energy is written as the kinetic energy of particle 1 plus that of particle 2. And it turns out very useful to introduce a vector r, which is the center of mass, and that's uh, defined as usual as m1 r1 plus um, m2 r2. And what we would like to do is write the kinetic energy as a combination of the center of mass kinetic energy and some other kinetic energy which is related to the internal motion of the system. So now recall that at the start we had defined this parameter r, which is the length of the vector r2 minus r1. And that vector r2 minus r1, we will denote that now as the vector r. So the vector r is r2 minus r1. And so if we want to express the kinetic energy in terms of the kinetic energy associated with the capital R and the small r, we need to find first the vector r1 in terms of capital R and small r. So we have three definitions, the center of mass, the relative coordinate, and I have also included here a capital M, which denotes m1 plus m2. And using those three definitions, it's easy to write r1 as capital R minus m2 over capital M times r. If you fill in these two forms and use this, you can easily verify that the right hand side indeed reduces to R1 and similarly we can write that R2 equals R plus M1 over M times the relative coordinate R. So let us now return to the kinetic energy T and then plug in for the R1 and the R2, D2 and D2 expressions that we have found here. So here I filled in these expressions and we see that, uh, for example, the term with the capital R dot primed squared is equal to M1 plus M2 over 2 times R dot squared. So that means that this is, can also be written as the capital M divided by 2 times R dot squared. And so this is the center of mass kinetic energy. Next, we deal with the term proportional to R dot squared, little r dot squared. We get one term from the first uh, from the first part on the right hand side that's m1 times m2 squared divided by capital M squared and then from the second part we get an m2 times m1 squared divided by the 2 capital M squared multiplied obviously by the little r dot squared. Now let us have a look at the remaining terms so those are the, the double products and if you carefully consider those, you can quickly see that this one gives you minus m1 m2 over m times capital R dot, little r dot. And this one gives the same term, but with an opposite sign. So this is it. We are done. Well, we can still streamline the uh, second term a little bit, because we can extract m1 and m2 from both terms in the numerator and then we are left with m1 plus m2 but it's equal to the capital M so we can can cancel that term and we are left with this and we see that the second term has the dimension of a mass and it's called mu it's generally denoted by mu mu is m1 m2 divided by m it's called the reduced mass
And a simple way to remember the value of mu is to write it in the form 1 over mu is 1 over m1 plus 1 over m2, which can easily be verified from its definition. And this tells you that uh, the mu itself, it's always smaller than the value of m1 and the value of m2. So having now the kinetic energy at our disposal in a rather convenient form makes it easy to write up the Lagrangian because that's simply the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. And so we then arrive at this form. Here I've copied first the kinetic energy from there. And then we subtract the potential energy which only depends on the norm of the vector r. So now we can write up the equations of motion and here I've started by writing up the equation of motion for the capital R, for the vector capital R. And we have d dt dl dr dot, the gradient with respect to these velocity coordinates. And uh, from this equation it's easy to see that if you take the gradient with respect to the vector r dot you get an m times the vector r dot. And the time derivative of this should be equal to the derivative of L with respect to R, the capital R. But there is no capital R dependence in the Lagrangian. Capital R is an independent variable from the capital R dot. And so here we get a zero, which tells us that the R dot is constant. And so this tells us that the equation, that the velocity of the center of mass is constant and that's not really a surprising result but it's a very important result so the motion of the center of mass is constant so the first term in the Lagrangian is a constant and therefore it's uh, not so relevant for the equations of motion we can always put it in later and so from now on we will leave it out and therefore the main Lagrangian we will be dealing with from now on is the Lagrangian only in terms of the relative coordinate that's the small r and it's given by mu over 2 r dot squared that's the internal kinetic energy of the system associated with the relative motion of r1 and r2 and then we have a minus v of r and that's only dependent on the length of the vector r of the relative coordinate. So what does this Lagrangian describe? Well if we see that Lagrangian we interpret it as a Lagrangian of a single particle with a mass mu and with a coordinate r. And so I've put that picture here in a, in a plane there is a, a mass mu and it's at position r. Now furthermore there is a force which I can derive from this V and that's always uh, directed towards the origin or from the origin. So that depends whether it's an attractive or a repulsive force but the force is always directed along the line connecting the origin and the position of the particle. Now if in addition the particle has an initial velocity V then this line connecting the origin and the particle and v, the vector v, they span a plane and I have indicated that plane here and because the force doesn't have any component perpendicular to that plane and the initial velocity is also in the plane the motion will always be in the plane and so we can consider the motion as being completely two, well it is in fact completely two-dimensional so we have a 2D motion and it's impossible for the particle to have a motion outside of this plane. It's the plane spanned by the line connecting the origin and its initial position and its initial velocity. As we have a 2D motion and we have a potential that only depends on R, it makes sense to introduce now polar coordinates. Those are the coordinates R and the angle phi that's the angle that this line here makes with the with an x-axis so let us take the x-axis here then there would be an angle phi here move the r over there and we know then that the 
kinetic energy can be written in terms of these polar, polar coordinates as follows. It's mu over 2 and now we have r dot squared plus r squared phi dot squared minus v of r. So note the difference between the vector r dot squared and the scalar r dot squared. So the scalar only tells us what this motion is, so the motion along the direction of r, but if the particle would go somewhere in that direction it has a component along r and one perpendicular to that and they both contribute to the velocity. And so this is the kinetic energy. So now we could also write this obviously as l depending on r and phi and on their time derivatives. So now we can write up the equations of motion for both r and phi. So we start with the uh, equation of motion for the little r and um, we f this is the Lagrange equation and uh, if I calculate dl dr dot what we find is simply mu r dot. So that's the acceleration along the radial direction and it should be equal to dl dr. Well there is obviously first the force that the particles exert on each other and that is derived from the v so that's minus dv dr. But there is a second uh, dependence on the r and that's this term which contains the phi dot and uh, if we calculate what that is it's mu r phi dot squared. So we have two contributions to the force. One is the force that particle 2 exerts on particle 1 and the second force is associated with this angle phi. So let's quickly move on to the equation of motion for the phi. So here is that equation and if we work it out we first get the term d dt and then taking the derivative with respect to this phi dot we see that we obtain mu r squared phi dot. Those are all the phi dot dependencies and there is no phi dependence and so we immediately see that this should be zero and therefore we have identified a conserved quantity. Inspecting the form of that conserved quantity uh, shows that this is nothing but the angular momentum L which is obviously conserved as there are no external forces acting on the system. L being just a constant allows us to express phi in terms of R and L. We can write that phi dot is given by L divided by mu R squared. And if we plug that into the equation for R we see that the left hand side can be written as mu r dot dot and then we obtain mu r times phi dot squared which I replace by L over mu r squared squared minus dv dr And so I can work that into the form L squared divided by mu r to the third minus dv dr. And so we see that we have an equation now, an equation of motion for a one-dimensional coordinate that is r dot dot and uh, we can write that into the form r dot dot is minus the gradient of some effective potential which depends only on r. We see that this is a function that depends only on r, l and u are constant, and this is also a function which depends on r. And so we can lump them together into a single effective potential
and that effective potential is V minus plus L squared over 2 mu R squared. So we have now the picture that the relative coordinate is described as a by a one-dimensional equation of motion and it has a force which contains two contributions. One contribution is just the force that the two particles exert on each other, that's the gradient of this uh, bare potential, but in addition we have a force that is uh, in fact due to the, to the uh, angular motion and this in fact uh, gives me the centrifugal force which is caused by the fact that two particles are orbiting around each other and so they, they have then an extra contribution to the uh, to the force in the r direction which is the centrifugal force so we see that we end up with a lagrangian which is written in fact for a one dim for a one dimensional particle with a coordinate r and we can write this lagrangian as mu r dot squared over 2 minus the effective potential where the effective potential has this extra centrifugal contribution in addition to the potential which is uh, caused by the attraction of the two particles. Now having this uh, we can also calculate the uh, Hamiltonian and it's not difficult to see that the Hamiltonian is then p squared over 2 mu plus v effective uh, so that this is a standard calculation obviously for a one-dimensional particle the uh, l is t minus v and h is t plus v if we don't have any external time dependence and also the absence of external time dependence tells me that this uh, expression here should be constant in time and I call that e so e is a constant in time and that's uh, really important to realize there is some conservation of energy in this case and it's important for the solution of the Kepler problem which we will now move to and in fact we know that uh, this p squared over 2 mu we can also write it as mu r dot squared plus the effective potential and it is uh, this form that we will need when we tackle the Kepler problem which is a very important problem it describes the motion of the planets around the Sun and so that's a uh, application we are going to consider if the force between the part the two particles is a gravitational force so it's derived from the gravitational potential then uh, we get the motion of celestial bodies that only feel one attractive center and so we use now in order to solve this problem we use the fact that we know the constants of the motion and so the first constant of the motion is the energy and the energy um, is in fact given by this expression it's um, the kinetic energy plus the potential energy and the poten part of the potential energy uh, derives from the angular motion in order to proceed with the solution we use the fact that uh, we have we know two constants of the motion and those are the energy and the angular momentum the energy obviously it's kinetic energy plus the potential energy which includes then the centrifugal energy and there is the uh, angular momentum which is mu r squared phi dot and now in order to proceed um, we are not going to solve the equations of motion for r and phi separately but we are just going to find the shape of the orbitals and in order to find the shape of the orbitals what we need is d phi dr or the r d phi as you wish and we realize that we can find that by just taking phi dot over r dot using elementary math math and then we take the r dot and the phi dot from these two equations in order to find an equation for the shape of the orbitals so we replace the phi dot here by l divided by mu r squared uh, 
and the r dot squared is found from this equation but it's an equation for r dot squared so we have to take a square root and that's why we have a plus and a minus sign possible in the denominator and in the square root we have these terms these three terms we have not yet specified the form of v that will come in a minute so putting in now really vr is minus a over r and then streamlining the equation a little bit we obtain this equation now moving one of those r's into the square root we see that the right hand side has this form so i've just to put it in simplest form and this is an integral that we know that we can look up and it turns out that, that the result is the following the integral has a for, has the form of an arc sine and uh, it's the arc sine of this argument which contains one new parameter and that new parameter is the epsilon here and the epsilon is defined as the square root of 1 plus 2e l squared divided by mu a squared. So just in order to streamline the uh, notation a little bit, epsilon is convenient, but as, as we shall see, it also has a meaning in terms of the uh, uh, geometry of the orbits. To find that uh, geometry, we need to invert the equation in order to write r as a function of phi and then it turns out we get this form and uh, what we see is that r is a function of sine phi and that means that uh, this it is a, that r itself is a periodic function of phi now that may seem obvious but it is not it tells you that when you have rotated over two, 360 degrees so over 2 pi then r gets the same value back again so it tells you that we get closed orbits and that's really special for the Kepler solution that the orbits are closed. They are ellipses so you can show that this equation describes an ellipse and the fact that the ellipse is closed is a very special property of the gravitational interaction. So here you see a simple Python program which I wrote in order to solve the equation of motion for a particle in two dimensions and I will show how that program works for the Kepler problem. So I will not go into the details of the Python or of the plotting part of this program but just focus on the dynamics which uh, tells you how the particle's positions evolve. The position is uh, encoded into a vector r which is two dimensional. The velocities are given by the vector p, momentum also two dimensions and I take the mass equal to one so p is just the velocity in this case. The initial conditions are that the particle is released on the x-axis at 1, 0 and it leaves the x-axis with a velocity in the y direction of 0.4. Uh, the solution proceeds by moving the particle step by step and uh, the time elapsing between two time steps is 0 0.0005. Now I take the Kepler force the gravitational force as minus one over r so the prefactor is simply minus one and if i calculate the force from this potential i get minus the vector r divided by r to the third and you see that that is encoded here in this uh, function which calculates the force so we have minus r divided by r to the third then the actual solution takes place in this part of the program and it's done in the so-called velocity Verley algorithm which I will not go into in detail but it's a very simple and uh, accurate way of solving equations of motion of course the uh, part which really determines the shape of the orbit is this the call to force if I would change the force I get a different motion and so it is interesting to see what we get uh, from this program so when I press the enter key the program starts running and we see that we get a perfect ellipse which is quite eccentric and it's uh, so this is the attraction of the center of attraction this is the origin and we see that the particle passes very close by the attraction center the uh, orbit is a closed ellipse 
and it is this ellipse is traversed several tens of times but uh, we do not see that because it's each time the same orbit so you don't see the particle really moving So it is interesting to study the case where the force is not a pure Kepler force but where it's slightly distorted. As you can see here I have introduced a parameter eta which I will take small and it gives you a distortion from the gravitational potential um, and the force that I can derive from this it's also an easy calculation it's 1 plus eta r divided by r to the power 3 plus eta. So the only thing which I changed in the program the only essential change is this introduction of the parameter eta, which I've done here according to, to this formula. And so it is interesting then to see what happens. Uh, I will take the eta first zero, so then we get the previous case where we have a pure Kepler orbit, and that's drawn in blue. Then we will see the orbit for eta equal to 0 0.01, and then I will take eta minus 0.01, and that will the last two will be respectively a green and a red curve. Okay, so let's see what we get when we start the program. First we see obviously the blue curve just as before, the close Kepler orbit, because that was the case where eta was zero. Then the green curve, you see that it's no longer a closed orbit, but it's a precessing ellipse and it precesses in the positive y direction. Then the red curve corresponds to eta minus 0.01 and that gives me a curve that precesses in the negative y direction. So you see that the fact that the orbit is closed in the Kepler case is really a special feature of the form of that potential which is the 1 over r potential. So let us enjoy the beautiful picture once again. Here you see the closed blue curve and then the precessing green and red curves which correspond to a slight distortion from the pure gravitational force.